The biggest reason why um, I chose to be a part of the missions team is because it's about being something that's bigger than yourself. I personally have a passion for people. I have a huge heart for um, meeting people where they are and just kind of being there and giving any support that I can give. The thing that impacted me the most was when a little boy came in and he was being carried. He had glass in his foot and they, the surgeons took the glass out of his foot and he didn't have any shoes and we were out of children's shoes so I took off my shoes and gave it to him and he walked out with a smile and not being carried out. Um, I would say that the thing that impacted me the most is when we'd be on a build site that the family that we'd be helping uh, needed a house so bad that they would jump in and do all the work with us. It wasn't just us doing the work and they just needed the house so bad. Everyone worked very hard. I mean, I could look to my left and I can look to my right and see that the person next to me was working just as hard as I was working and everyone was giving their all nonstop. Our church come together is like as a team and just like all the just gathering to help and love and, and just seeing the heart of what was going on but also the heart of the people that was there. Um, I knelt down to play with these three little baby girls and one of them was clutching a bottle just had this bottle she was carrying around with her and there was just a little bit of liquid in it and it was cloudy and, and yucky looking and I just noticed um, some bugs floating around in this bottle and I'll never forget that image as long as I live and I was just thinking about how stuff we take for granted just normal things like having something clean to drink is just such a um, a need over there and it just makes you so thankful for everything that we have and so willing to help um, others that don't have those things. The way that Jesus served his people whenever he walked on the earth is an example of how we should serve the people not only here in our backyards like we do all the time but also overseas or in different cities in different countries partnering and not going in and taking over, but being able to make a difference year-round, not just one week out of the year. When you're standing in those clinics and you see people come in with just such basic medical needs that, that are so easily fixed, you see somebody come in, an, an older lady who they carry in, and you see her walk out with a walker. She's just never had a walker before. Or you see someone with an infection in their foot because of something in it and you see our surgeons be able to remove that and, and we give them fresh shoes and they're able to walk out on their own pretty much pain free. Or you just see these basic things that here we have um, access to and there they just don't have that access and you, you're surrounded by all of that and you just see these people come in pain in great need and you see them leave Fixed. It's just such an amazing thing to be a part of. And um, that's what I would want people to know. We can make a difference. Your support can make a difference. The team is making a difference in just a week's time. The Lord really stirred in my heart that we are on a missions field, not only here at home, but we have the opportunity and the ability to extend the love of Christ and to use our unique gifts and talents and take them all over the world. Hi, my name is Denzel. Welcome to the Courageous Church. And my name is Deborah. We're so excited that you're here. Today is our Souls for Souls. We are so close to our DR-17 mission trip. To stop disease and injury, one of the greatest needs in that area is shoes. All styles and sizes. Today you can show your sacrificial support by joining us and giving the shoes right off your feet. We did this last year and your response was incredible. We were able to take hundreds of pairs of shoes to bless the people of DR. If you come prepared today, please donate your shoes and leave them in the crate on your way out. Thank you for giving your shoes and being a blessing through Souls for Souls. Here at TCC, we want everyone to be needed and known. A huge part of that is becoming part of the Dream Team. This is a team of people who've decided to make Courageous their home and found an area to serve in that they're passionate about. And the best way to be part of the Dream Team is by going through Growth Track. These are three easy steps to help you discover your purpose at Courageous. Step two of Growth Track is today at 11 o'clock. You can join right in. If you have questions about Growth Track, check out our website, 
or you can go to guest services for help. We have childcare and snacks. And one of the best ways to grow your relationship with God and your relationship with other people is to surround yourself with those who will encourage you, challenge you, and remind you that you're not alone in whatever is going on in your life. That's what small groups are all about, being needed and known. Throughout the week, we have small groups that gather around the city in homes, restaurants, and coffee shops to talk about life. We have groups for men, women, married couples, and students. So whatever phase of life you're in, we have a group for you. It's not too late to join one. Just head to the directory of small groups on the website to find the perfect group for you. We are excited to begin a new sermon series next Sunday called House Party. You don't want to miss even one Sunday of this fun series. And we'll kick the first week of the series off with Father's Day, partnering with all you dads. We can't wait to celebrate you, so bring a friend, come ready for Father's Day and house party. Calling all creatives. Save the date Wednesday, June 21st, because Create Night is at our North location at 6.30 p.m. This is a time for anyone interested in becoming part of the creative team or if you just want to find out more about it. Come hang out with us and grow your skill, whether that's social media, web, events, videography, graphic design, live production. This is a night where the creative juices are flowing. Anyone is welcome. Thank you so much for being with us today. We believe that you're here for a reason. Let us know if we can help you out with anything while you're here. We hope you have a great weekend. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Courageous Church. I am so glad that you're here today. I love this church, and I am thankful uh, for this great, great Sunday. Now, one thing we have to celebrate before we do anything else, every location, every service, 19 people gave their life to Jesus last week, and 15 people were baptized. Can you give it up right now like a party? Come on, shout it out. That is a big deal. I am so thankful for what God is doing in lives, and I'm glad that you are and I get to be a part of that as well. And so today we're concluding our series, The Bad Habits of Jesus, and uh, today I, um, I want to talk to you about something Jesus did that you tell your kids not to do, that you try not to do in life. It's this, that Jesus had the wrong kind of friends, all right? Jesus had the wrong kind of friends. If you show me your friends, I'll show you your future. Friends are important. But Jesus had all the wrong kind of friends along the way. So let's talk about the bad habits of Jesus. Here's what we need to know. When Jesus did things that were offensive to others, when Jesus did things that you look at like, that's not right, I wouldn't do that. It's there to teach us or show us something deeper about the goodness and the love of God. And so um, the, the, the Bible tells us in Matthew 10, when Jesus is talking to his followers, he's like, just, just understand something. Uh, I'm the prince of peace, but there's going to be times when I'm going to disturb the peace. How many of you have been written up for that? Come on, my fraternity people. All right. Well, anyway, this is something that Jesus told them, like, what I'm bringing is not what's here now, and so it's going to be disruptive at times, and so I want you to know there's going to be tension. And he said this in Matthew 10, 34, um, do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. Now, that doesn't mean that he's hurting people. It just means that, that the, 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 the kingdom of God sometimes is disruptive. And, and, it, and it heals, and it's ultimately for the good. Just like a surgeon cuts with a sword, Jesus changed things just like a surgeon in order to heal our world. And so um, Jesus was one that was a revolutionary. Some called him the revolutionary rabbi. He was a teacher. And uh, he had all the wrong kind of friends. Like Jesus spent his time with outcasts. Jesus spent his time with people. If you're trying to build a movement, you want to network with people that can help you. I scratch your back, you scratch my back. Jesus didn't do anything like that at all. Matter of fact, he, he largely did the opposite. So it says in Luke chapter 5, 27, this, uh, after this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector. Remember, they hated tax collectors. They were the lowest of the low, just like Zacchaeus from week one. Okay, they hated all tax collectors. This is another group of tax collectors. They saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting in his tax booth. 
Follow me, Jesus said to him, and Levi got up. He left everything and followed him. Then, this is awesome, when Jesus does something in your life, you want to tell your friends about it. When Jesus does something in your life, or you find out where he's at, you're like, hey, come, 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 come see this, you know? And so then Levi, in verse 29, held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them, okay? A lot of people that were hated, a lot of people that were not liked. It says in verse 30, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect, complained to his disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, look, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. And so Jesus hung out with all the wrong people and infuriated the people who thought they were the right people. But this is the essence of the kingdom of God and the goodness of Jesus. He comes to make the insiders outsiders and the outsiders insiders. This is a powerful thing. And so if society rejected you, Jesus wanted you to know that society didn't speak for God. And that's a powerful thing. So, so Jesus had all the wrong kind of friends because Jesus was a friend of sinners. He didn't, he didn't like look at people that were sinners and say, oh, that's so great. I'm so, I am so happy about your sin. But he didn't write sinners off either. He didn't like condone sin and say it was okay, but he didn't write it off and, and, and push people out when they had problems. Like, like Jesus made people that, that were known to be sinners, like all these tax collectors, he made them feel different. Like he would sit with them and he would, he would talk with them and he would laugh with them and he would enjoy their company and they'd be like, I've never felt this way before. I've never been loved like this before. How can this guy do that? Listen, here's something powerful about the gospel and Jesus and how we need to do things here. And I need you to help me with this. Jesus let people belong long before they believed or behaved. Jesus let people belong long before they believed or behaved. We don't need to be shocked when real life happens. We don't need to be shocked when things, you know, that are, that are, that are, that are real take place. Like it just, it just, it's, just, it's just terrible when we're shocked. This church serves the general public, okay? Don't you believe in your purse laying around. We serve the general public, all right? And so... Um, Jesus would relate to people differently. Like just because you were notorious in the community, he was not going to relate to you like he was a cop or like he was that vice principal from your high school you didn't like. He built bridges to people, all right? And so this is a problem. <clears throat> when sin in our minds comes, becomes more important than the sinner, we have a problem because alarms should be going off. We are called by Jesus, if you're a Christian, to care for and reach for people, all right? And so the Bible says God so loved the world. God loved the whole world, not just the parts of the world that already loved him and were behaving nicely. He loved the whole world. We need to have the kind of heart that Jesus had, which said, I'll include people who others have excluded. And that's what grace is like. Like grace, the goodness of God gives you what you don't deserve. Now, as you know, I am a hugger. I am a hugger. I will hug. I, I, I like hugs. I, I like hugs better than drugs. I like hugs. I will, I will hug you anywhere. I don't, I, 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 I've made enough mistakes with hugging though that I, I try to surmise or decide in my head, is this person a hugger or not? Because I've hugged some of y'all and y'all went like, you got like you started planking. So I realized, oh, mark it down. They're not a hugger. But we'll try everything once. Like I, I've always said, I don't know if you've been to the Cox North elevator, but it's basically the size of a coffin. And I'll hug you in the Cox North elevator. I don't care. It's just kind of what I do. But, but, but when you hug somebody and they're not a hugger, it's awkward. And you're like, I don't know. I don't know. You flip to the side, you, you tuck in, you push back or whatever. Like when grace comes many times, we, we treat it like it's an awkward hug. Like ah, I got a plank, I got a plank. I got to stop this. Like the grace of God comes and you're not prepared for it. It's so good. And that's how Jesus is. You know, religion says if you behave and you believe, then you can belong. But Jesus says you can belong and then believe and, and you'll behave eventually. This is the power of the gospel. And so Jesus was friends with people who were sinners and Jesus was friends with small people. I'm not talking about short people. I'm talking about people who are marginalized in society. Like if, if, if society didn't think much of them, Jesus didn't let that affect his heart. Jesus didn't marginalize the marginalized. 
Uh, one of the, the clearest features of Jesus was that he included people others left out. And he had the bad habit of liking people who were not like anybody else. And he liked people who were absolutely unlikable. Like Jesus came into the world in a way that we never would have come into the world. He came into the world surrounded by animals and he left the world surrounded by criminals. Jesus was very much counterculture to us trying to climb a ladder somewhere. Like he had a soft spot for for the unchurched people and for the de-churched people. His, his, his first visitors to his birth were shepherds that never went to church and Zoroastrian priests from the Gentile world that did not worship him as God were at his birth. Like Jesus was just different and, and he, he, he fixated on the little people and, 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 and ignored the big people many times. And, and, and he, he, he slid up next to people that were hurting him. He rejected the movers and the shakers uh, along the way many times. Why? I don't know why, but I know this. Jesus trusted his mission and loved people who wouldn't pass most, most HR screenings if you tried to get a job here in Springfield. Like, you would not pass the HR screening, but Jesus wants you. Like, you can't discount small people. You can't discount people that others have written off. It is essential to realize that God has called every person to be an image bearer of God. They have worth and value. Like Coca-Cola, I don't know if anybody drinks that anymore. I know that, that many do. And uh, Coca-Cola, you know that? It's 99.8% water. Yeah, when you drink Coca-Cola, 99.8% water. But they have built an empire on 0.2%. 0.2% of Coca-Cola is the ingredients and the rest is all water. Understand something, that little things, little people can make a big difference and they should not be written off. And Jesus modeled that for us. We should never be the kind of a church that, that separates based upon money or separates based upon race or separates based upon... Listen, we're all a part of God's, of God's family. And so, and so the next thing is this, Jesus... Was, was friends first off with sinners. He was friends with, with small people. But then he was friends with what I would call throwaways. Jesus was friends with throwaways. What does that mean? Well, the thief on the cross. It's a story that we're going to talk about in Luke 23. This is a guy who wasted his life. Jesus is on the cross dying. The thief that stole and was no good was there right next to him. And that thief was one of the worst criminals he was getting what he deserved. Like when you crucify somebody in that day, it's because you didn't know what else to do with them. Like nothing else worked. And so here you go. We're going to crucify you. And normally they, they tied them to the cross. But when they would escape and they had like, you know, prison break or whatever, they would then nail them to the cross so they wouldn't get away. And so I think on that day they were nailing those other guys to the cross. And like uh, Jesus was there like, okay, put them up. And like, did you bring the rope? No, I didn't bring the rope. He's like, all right, we're nailing today. Like the, and so Jesus... Jesus is nailed to the cross with these guys. And so they put Jesus on the cross, and, and uh, you can see it here in Luke 23, verse 39. It says, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at Jesus. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. Like, well, these, these were not good dudes. These were not people that anybody had anything for. They probably had families. They probably had people that loved them at one time. Those people, there's no record of them being there. They had probably exasperated everybody. They'd probably staged interventions. <laughs> They'd probably done everything they could do. And these dudes were just left, okay? They had nothing to offer. Their lives were, were wasted. Like, and they're cussing out Jesus. They're cussing out this guy. And, and, and like in their last moments, they're not thinking about their life. They're not thinking about what they did. They're just, they're just trying to hurt somebody else. You see that? Like these are throwaway people. And, and, and if you're Jesus, save us. Well, then something changed. Like something changed. I don't know what changed, but, but getting people close to Jesus affects their hearts in ways that we don't have a, a, a way to figure out why. It's through the Spirit of God or whatever. But in, in verse 40, something changed because it says here, but the other criminal rebuked him and said, don't you fear God? Since, since you're, uh, he said, since you're under the same sentence, we are punished justly for we're getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. He's like, listen, don't you fear God? He's saying the, the actions that we have taken, they have, they have consequences. We're reaping those consequences. He said, we're getting what we deserve, and this man has done nothing wrong. Like, so uh, this is a weird scene. 
Like, where does this leave the thief? The thief is like, nobody wants him. The government has given up on him. There's no hope for his reformation anywhere. There's no way anybody can change his life. Nobody wants this guy. What can Jesus do for him? What can he do for Jesus? He can't, he can't do anything with his hands because his hands are nailed to a cross. He can't go anywhere because his feet are nailed to a cross. It's really just too late. This guy is wasting his life. His life is over. He's got just maybe minutes or hours left. This is a throwaway person. No future, no hope. Verse 42. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him and said, truly I tell you, today you'll be with me in paradise. Jesus walked in heaven with his arm around a throwaway thief. Nobody wanted this poor guy, but Jesus did. And I'm, I'm blown away by the audacity of his prayer. Like, I have confidence that you can do for me what nobody else can do. This is a powerful thing. Jesus looked at this guy who had nothing to offer and gave him everything in a moment. We should not prejudge the people that God places into our lives. We should not ever look at people and say, oh, they're too far, they're not worthy, that's not gonna work. Jesus can do things that are different than what anybody else can do. This is interesting because Jesus included everybody. Nobody was out. And you and I, we are never too big to serve. We're never beyond seeing the worth and seeing the value of one person. And Jesus always defined his mission on the, on the basis of who he included. And so we can't think that we somehow can push people away. And we can't take the responsibility of loving people and say it's the church's job. Do not institutionalize your faith. Don't institutionalize the, like the, the, the actions of your faith, okay? Like we have to care and we have to have a heart that sees the potential in a soul. Look at Jesus. He didn't, sing, he didn't look at any situation as though it had no value. For example, in Matthew 15 and 30, the Bible says this about Jesus, that great crowds came to him bringing the lame. We know they can't walk the blind. We know they can't see the crippled. We know that their limbs aren't working, the mute, those that can't speak, and many others. Like This is, this is interesting because Jesus even had room for people that didn't fit a classification. They were just lumped into a group, others. Jesus said, I have time for you. Jesus had time for people that didn't fit anywhere else. And so Jesus marginalized himself at times, choosing to remain with outsiders in a, in a position where he would be evaluated by the values of our world negatively in order to help people. Listen, we as a church cannot ignore the people that are easy to ignore. We can't Look at a person and think, well, it's just not, no. The thief on the cross had minutes left and had wasted his entire life. But Jesus said, I will give you everything. What I love about the heart of our church is that it's, it's driven by the passions of the people inside of the church. Like we don't push things from the top down. We do things from the bottom up. And our, 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 our team, uh, our, our missions team is going to the Dominican Republic. And we're going to be doing things based upon passion. We're going to be setting up medical clinics for children and for, for mothers and for, and for people who work all day long that have never been able to see a doctor, who've never been able to take their children to a doctor. We're going to be serving them and helping them in the Dominican Republic. We're going to be building schools and churches that are, that are going to serve uh, at-risk populations in the Dominican Republic. Republic. Why? Because Jesus cared for those who were easy to ignore. Jesus never ignored those who were easy to ignore. And we don't just do that overseas and far off places. We do that here. Serve Day is coming up, okay? It's July 15th. And on Serve Day, we mobilize all of our church to go out into our community and to serve the needs and to serve the, the community in any way we can so that the name of Jesus would be glorified, so that the name of Jesus would be lifted up in our city. Why? Because we are the hands and feet of Jesus. And we're going to, to be uh, enlisting our small groups. And when our 
our small groups come together, you see, we are a church of small groups. We're a church that, 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 that is just made up of small groups. Now, that means that the ownership of, 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 of the passion that you have inside of you can be expressed, meaning that if your group has a passion to help somebody, we'll help you do that for Serve Day. We have anchor projects. We're doing a lot of amazing things, especially in Roberson Elementary, but I would really like to see this year our group leaders express their passion for others through this serve day by coming up with the projects that you'd like to do. And I know that's going to happen. This is a, a real thing because in our groups, that's where people have the ability to really grow and really get the foundation necessary to be the kind of uh, a foundation they need in life. Like, I don't know how we can really get to know people in the large group gatherings that we have across our city in the way that we need to if we don't put a priority on the individuals that show up. So small group leaders are the pastors of this church. They pastor people. They are shepherds. They draw people in. Small group leaders are recruiters. Small group leaders are like, I don't see Leroy has not been here in two. I'm a, where is Leroy? Well, listen, this is important that we care and that we inconvenience ourselves and that we understand that God is at work here. And where God's at work, things change and people change. And we want to be a part of that. And so we're invested in each other. And we don't look as people as though you're a sinner, you're an outsider, you're small, you're, you're not valuable, you're you're marginalized. I don't want, no, everybody matters to God and it matters here. And so, um, the, 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 we, we want, we want, we want, we want more than anything for, and I, I, I don't try, try not to say this because the church consultants told me not to, but as a church, like we are relationally intense. It's, it's kind of creepy, but it's just how we feel. Like I care deeply that people know each other. I, I, I care so much that people are invested in each other. I care so much, and I know the heart of God cares more than I ever could, that people are concerned about, like, I want to make sure they're okay. How are you doing? I want the kind of church that's liking each other's posts. I want the kind of church that's going deeper than social media, that's like face-to-face, -face, talking, caring, knowing one another. You've got to know the stories of people. Don't just look at people as though they're a face. There's a story behind everything that they are. We have to go deeper with that. And, and we, have to, we have to care for people that are easily forgotten. Like, you know, it's easy not to think about children. Children across our world are, are, are in many ways, you know, not treated with, with the kind of value they should be. We spend tons of energy and time and money to serve and to minister to children here at the Courageous Kids. I'm, I, I, at the Courageous Church through Courageous Kids. Like, I, I, I see the pictures and hear the stories from my own children of how uh, their lives are being impacted and how they're learning things from the scriptures. We have to be invested in children. We can't just have the kind of church that, that says, well, this is, this is for me and, and just watch my kids. We're not just watching your kids. We're praying over your kids. We're teaching your kids. We're leading your kids toward Jesus Christ because they matter desperately. This week... My youngest son, Evan, had a friend that was getting baptized at another church here in the city. He's like, I want to go support my friend. I'm like, that's great, son. I love that. And so, yes, but when you go there, remember, you're a pageant. And remember, son, that you represent your parents. And remember, son, that you represent the Courageous Church in some way. So I know you like to party. I know you like things to be lit. I know you like things to be, uh, you know, uh, just the kid just gets carried away. You know, I, I, put the, I put it on Facebook, but he's like, okay, dad, you can count on me. So my child goes to this other church and he checks in their, 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 their kids ministry there and he gives them an alias like his alias, and I got a picture of it. His alias was Rumpus Rodriguez. Rump, Rumpus Rod. Listen, we have to minister to kids because I need my kids to go to heaven. I'm. Not, I don't know. I, I'm just saying that we just that there's there's potential and there's 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 something God is doing in the lives of our kids. We have to be invested, and I need somebody to tell my kids about Jesus so they do the right thing. Like, 
Like we, we're invested in what we do. Like that's why we have a huddle for our dream team each week. Why? Because it's not just about getting work done. It's about getting the people done. Meaning that your connectedness to one another is one of the best ways for you to grow. Don't think that your part of what God is doing in the church is, is not significant. It's extremely significant. It's very significant. I have a friend who pastored a church. He's coached me and helped me. He, he pastored a church and planted a church in Lexington, Kentucky. And the church grew to 1,500 people. It was unbelievable. Well, here's his story. He's from Alabama, was never uh, a Christian, never knew about Jesus, never followed Jesus. And um, his friends invited him to church. And so he's like, yeah, I'll come. They didn't pick him up. They were meeting there. And so they were meeting at church and they had, they had, they had a coffee, they had a coffee bar. They had free coffee like we do. And he showed up there and he couldn't find his friends anywhere. And so he'd never been to church before. He's sweating. He's nervous. He's upset. He's not sure whether he belongs here. Everything feels different and strange. He's, he's concerned about it. And so he starts to leave and the coffee lady, the coffee lady sees him and the coffee's like, oh baby, come here. How are you today? I am so glad you're here. Now, did you come by yourself or did you bring somebody? No, I came by myself. So who invited you? Oh, yo, my friends invited me. Well, where are they at? Well, I don't know. I'm waiting on them. She's like, oh, don't worry about them. Me and you are here together. Here's some coffee. And she gave him some coffee. And here's his story. He said, the coffee woman saved my life. She wouldn't let me leave when I was nervous. She made me stay. She walked around with me till we found my friends. And she sees, he, he says this, the coffee lady saved my life. Jesus worked through the coffee lady. What am I telling you? I'm telling you that every soul and everything you do for God matters. Don't prejudge people. It's, it's in every Sunday, every Sunday, if you serve in this church, you need, to, you, need to, you need to find your why. Say, find your why. What, what is your why? So, so every week when I'm preaching or something, many times God will bring somebody to my mind and I'll, just, I'll be talking to them the whole time. Well, last week I'm going to share with you my why. I wasn't talking to him the whole time, but, but this is somebody I believe in. This, this picture I'm showing you is, is, is Joe Rover. And that's his wife, Kiki, and his son, Joel, on his wedding day. I had the privilege of marrying them. He's from Queens, New York. Look at your neighbor say, forget about it. Forget about it. Okay, he's from Queens, New York. And here's this story, and he related it to me, okay? He had a basketball scholarship to D1 Hofstra. And he said, I blew it badly selling drugs and being stupid. He said, I was looking at an eight-year jail sentence. I lied and said I was a drug user, even though he wasn't, to get into, drug treat, into a drug treatment program rather than go to prison. He said, I had interviews with rehab people like Daytop and other drug programs, but nobody would accept me because they knew what I was trying to do, which was convince people that he had a drug problem when he didn't, so he wouldn't get a harsh, harsh sentence. He said, but on the day of sentencing, the judge took a liking to me and didn't want to send me to upstate New York to jail. So he recalled my case, and four hours later, he called me and said, I've called Teen Challenge, which is a, which is a, a, a rehabilitation program um, for, for people with, with connections to drugs and stuff, and uh, they, have, they have one bed available, and you'll have to follow all their rules and teachings. He's like, they have an incredible success rate, and that's where you'll be going for one year. He's like, Joe says, I graduated in a year, and I stayed on for another year because I loved it so much. And when I, I signed myself out of that program, went back to my life in Queens, he says, I got destroyed by the world, LOL. He's like, I was doing good for a few months, but the survival behaviors from my past came back due to my living environment. He said, I came to Springfield eight years ago because of Kiki. And, 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 and he said, I wanted the light she had, and I needed to get out of New York. I wanted to change, but I was so good at what I did. I ignored many callings God had on my life, and I, I kept doing and living that life because I didn't want to appear soft. This Sunday, among the 15 people we baptized, I got a picture to show you. This is Joe being baptized. 
It's taken him some time. He sat around and looked at me and others to make sure that we weren't fake, to make sure there was something real happening here. But these kind of stories where God keeps working in somebody's life and people start growing little by little by little by little, just like an oak tree growing out of the ground. That is my why. What is your why? The person you greet in the parking lot, the person that you give a high five to at the door, the person that you serve at the coffee bar, the person that you check in in the kids area, whatever you're doing, however you're doing it, understand that you're touching somebody's story. You're touching back years and years in people's lives and it all matters and we can't discount people and we can't ignore people and we can't marginalize people. It matters to God. And he posted, he posted this on Facebook and, and I love this. He, he said, um, Having my son has made me responsible and more, fear, uh, and more fearful of failure. I can't teach him or raise him to be a man if I'm not leading or living as one. I want to be a great father, provider, and more importantly, husband. I got baptized today to symbolize my faith in Christ as well as to bury the old me and revive the new me. God's given him, God's given his all to me and more to my family, and it's time to return the favor. Thank you, Jesus. Date, I'm a new creation. Hashtag Rover take over. Can somebody clap your hands for what God has done, not just in one, but in 15 lives last week? It all matters to God, and we can't write people off. From people without names that we just meet for the first time, or people that have been hanging around for a while, or people like the girl who came to First Wednesday who's living in her car, doing everything she could do to survive, understand that every person has worth and value to God, and our hearts have to be moved, and our, our lives have to be engaged for friends that may start out being all the wrong kind of friends. This, I don't do haikus very often, but this haiku got me. It says this, to see small matters and to see that small matters are not small matters. To see small matters and to see that small matters are not small matters. Everybody has value to God. Even the people that tick you off. Even the people that are difficult. Case in point, my man, Doubting Thomas. This guy's difficult. Have you ever sold something on the Facebook marketplace? I have, all right? Here's how it typically goes. You write out all the pertinent details, trying not to miss anything. And then what happens is you get 30 or 40 questions about the stuff that you declared very clearly in the selling points. You know what I'm talking about? Like you said, it is red. Their question is, what color is it? <laughs> like, it does, not, it does not work. Does it work? Like, you get a million questions like that. Like, I, I, have, to, I have to be careful because I'm like, do you need a personalized explanation? Just read what's there. You know what I'm talking about? I know, I'm, uh, I know you feel what I feel. Well, this is Doubting Thomas. Doubting Thomas is one of those guys like, no, uh, what color is it? Um, um, it let's read the story. It says in John 20 and 24, now Thomas, also known as Didymus, was one of the 12. He was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen Jesus after his crucifixion, after his resurrection, we have seen Jesus. And he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again. Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, <laughs> Jesus came through the doors, glorified body, stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. All right. I wouldn't have done that for Thomas. Like, because Thomas had seen all the miracles of Jesus. He had heard all the teaching of Jesus. He had experienced when Jesus was crucified, how the world turned black and how Christians got up out of the ground and graves were open. Thomas knew all that happened. And he's like, I won't believe. He's like the guy asking questions on Facebook marketplace. But Jesus took time for this guy and didn't give up on him. You know, I was studying something the other day about the spread of Christianity in the world. And we know that Christianity started in Israel in the Middle East, but when you go back and study as early as 52 AD, Christianity was introduced to India. Today in India, there's like 
27 million Christians in India. And it's an ancient church. It was started in 52 AD. You know how that church in India started? Through a guy named Thomas. Thomas went to India when everybody else was, was evangelizing and sharing the gospel in the Middle East. And there is a testimony of Christianity that has endured for thousands of years in India. When he went to India, Thomas was met with a Hindu population. And Christian tradition tells stories of how he went to where they were drinking, uh, they, were, they were pulling water out of the river and throwing it up in the air, offering it to, to the gods of the, 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 the river or whatever it was. And Thomas said, if I can cause this water to go up into the air and never come back down, would you hear about my Savior Jesus? And sure enough, Christian tradition says he threw it up in the air and the water stayed right there in the air. And many were converted by the miracles of Thomas. For example, one of the stories about Thomas was he was in uh, he was in India, and a king had given him money to build a house uh, to, 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 for some reason. And, 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 and Thomas was giving that money away to people that were sick and poor and hurting. And the king was so mad that he put Thomas in jail. And um, the story goes on to say that that same night that Thomas was put in jail, the king's brother died. He was dead for a couple days, and he came back to life. And he said, when I was dead, I had a vision of Thomas building a house for us in heaven that was bigger and grander than anything else, and the king was converted. All these stories show the miracle-working power of Jesus Christ working through a guy that I personally would have written off because he would have frustrated me. No matter what you're up against or who you're up against or how frustrated you might be, understand that Jesus does not give up on those that others give up on. He didn't write Thomas off, and therefore Thomas didn't write India off. When people disappoint you and doubt you and frustrate you, it's easy to move on, but Jesus does not move on. Why am I saying this? Because I want you to know that Jesus is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And he doesn't care who it offends. He doesn't care who it bothers. Jesus cares about you. And Jesus wants you as you are right now. He won't give up on you.